Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's town hall uh, hosted by SMA Michael Grinston and Command Sergeant Major Andrew Lombardo from the U.S. Army Reserve Command. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us, uh, especially those uh, during battle assembly. We've got a lot of watch parties out there today and uh, looking forward to the discussion and the questions. So uh, with that, Sergeant Major Lombardo, over to you. Thank you, Sergeant First Class Rainier. Army Reserve soldiers, good afternoon. On behalf of General Daniels and the entire command team, I'd like to welcome you to the Army Combat Fitness Test Town Hall, where I get the distinct privilege to introduce your Sergeant Major of the Army, Sergeant Major of the Army, Michael Grinston. So I know that many of you are attending Battle Assembly and this is part of your scheduled training while others will tune in and watch later. So for the commanders out there and leaders, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to do this. Um, as you know, the Army Combat Fitness Test is the assessment for the physical domain of the Army's holistic health and fitness program. Physical fitness is an important component of individual and unit readiness. That's because we must make sure that all soldiers are physically and mentally prepared to deploy, fight, and win. And as the SMA constantly reminds me, winning matters. With that said, there have been many questions regarding the new assessment, and today those questions will be answered. This session, like uh, Sergeant Rainier said, is being recorded, and the link will be placed on our Army Reserve Facebook page, so those who do not have the opportunity to watch live are able to access the information shared in today's town hall. Before we begin, I just want to thank everybody for your service to the dedicated Federal Reserve of the Army, America's Army Reserve, and how you represent and communicate the value of service to our nation, to your communities. I ask that each of you talk about your story as twice the citizen to your families, friends, employers, and coworkers. You are our number one priority and the most effective recruiters that we have. And with that, I'll turn it over to our 16th Sergeant Major of the Army. The floor is yours, SMA. Sergeant Major Lombardo, thank you for your opening comments and thank everyone for tuning in today and I look forward to the discussion. Before I even get started with the discussion about the Army Combat Fitness Test, I just want to say there's a lot going on in the world right now. So we just sent thousands of soldiers to Europe. Um, I truly don't believe that COVID still, you know, kind of finished yet. And all that we do in the active component would not be possible without the mission of uh, the support of the Army Reserve, especially when you look at the, the fourth no notice deployment of the 82nd over to Poland and a no notice deployment of first brigade of third ID. And I'd just like to say, you know, let's keep all of those soldiers that are over there uh, in our thoughts and prayers as they go through a difficult no notice mission with all the other things that are going on in our, our country. So I really appreciate everybody. And I wanted to just take a little time today to talk about some of the eight Army Combat Fitness policies and procedures, you know, for all our soldiers, because this is important. And with all that we do, leadership matters here, especially with fitness. There's a lot of information that's gonna be talked about today. Um, this is just a discussion. There's been updated policies, there's updated doctrine. Um, so this does not substitute for any reading of the Army directive or those policies. This is just an additive to give some clarity for all that information. So I encourage everyone to take time to read the Army directive and the executive orders that are gonna follow. And anytime that you can find yourself reading up on the field manuals and the Army training publications, They'll be out soon and I ask you all to go ahead and take time to read through those. So I look forward to it and we'll just kind of jump right in. As I'm still waiting for the first slide to come up. Okay. If you could go ahead and go to the first slide, please. There are those things. Okay. I got the spinning dial here, but we'll continue to go. Um, here's where we're at uh, with the Army Combat Fitness Test. I just want to talk about the evolution of what this has. I'm really excited uh, on this evolution. It's taken us 40 years to actually change the Army Combat Fitness Test. We've been developing this test for years, and for three years, it's actually changed. We had Army Combat Fitness Test, the original version. Um, then it was agent or neutral. Then it was 
1.0, then we went to 2.0, then eventually we got to 3.0, and that was the latest version of the test that came out in June of 2020. And we had some a little bit of gender norming in there, and it was designed as an occupational fitness test with occupational standards. And that's kind of how it evolved over time. But what it is now, um, if you go to the next slide, is this is the Army Combat Fitness Test. This is not 4.0. We're dropping all the numbers and the letters of everything. This is just going to be the Army Combat Fitness Test. The We removed the leg tuck. We've added the walk back for units without uh, alternate testing equipment. And that's one of the reasons we added that walk back in so that you could um, do some of that without equipment because the alternate events were just uh, bike, swim, rower, and so we added the walk back in. So the diagnostic test will begin in 1 April, and the record test for United States Army Reserve and the Army National Guard will begin in 1 April 23. Some of the personal actions uh, may start uh, a little more, a little later, but most everything for the Army National Guard and the Army Reserves will start on 1 April 23. You can um, take a diagnostic test um, before uh, April 23, and if you do, and you pass, and you'd like to use that on your, and uh, with dialogue with your commander, say, I want to use this prior to April 23. Once you hit April 23, that could be your test of record. But for the total army, complete total army, the implementation for everyone will be complete by April of 2024. And if you want to have more information about the test that there is the website right there at the bottom you can get that link and then you can go and look up all the things on the army combat fitness test but how did we get to this version of the test when if you could go to the next slide please um, we did a rand independent study um, the rand independent study was um, ordered off the National Defense Authorization Act, where they um, they said we had to do an independent study of the Army Combat Fitness Test. So that was complete actually in February. And based off the recommendations in the RAND study, this is um, how we developed the test that you just that I just explained to you, and how we came up with those uh, items that we just talked about where we removed the leg tuck, and if I didn't fail to mention, we normed the test as opposed to being gender neutral. When you look at it, here's the, the recommendations, and for those of you maybe can't see those right up front, I'll just go ahead and say, the independent RAND study had four top level recommendations. They were addressed shortfalls of the ACFT evidence base, consider ways to mitigate impacts to the workforce. That's one of the reasons that we gender uh, norm the test to mitigate that and says take steps to uh, support training improvements over time and that's why we have some of the longer lead times for the united states army reserve so we take some more time to go ahead and implement the test and then institutionalize a formal senior level management structure and there is a structure that will do biannual reviews on the army combat fitness test so basically we took all the recommendations and we listened to them. And then over the course of the last six or seven months, we've developed a course of action. And that's the reason why we have the new Army Combat Fitness Test. And it's based on evidence. And the one thing that we did change, and what's if you were to read the RAND study, it said, you know, consider norming the test. So it doesn't make it one of the recommendations there, but it actually says it in the RAND study. Um, so this is based off of the RAND study and the evidence-based and a sample size of 630,000 Army Combat Fitness Test records. So we took the evidence of all that, everybody taking the Army Combat Fitness Test for the last uh, year or two, plus the RAND study, and then we mitigated the impacts. And I just described those impacts. One of those was make it gender normed. And then I talked about their training and the governance over time. Go to the next slide, please. And here's what we developed as the scales we we relatively went back to the the age and gender normed you know brackets that we had for the apft so when you look at these age brackets you'll see a very similar if you looked at the apft and that's important because 
the similar brackets would assume and similar standards, not similar standards because it's a completely different test. But when you went to age and gender normed, you we would expect similar results. So we don't have all the results because we hadn't taken the test for record. But when some would say, how do you mitigate the impacts? Well, we mitigated it by making it gender normed and by age. And that's how we mitigate the impacts. And we would assume that similar pass and fail rates like we had with the APFT. And the, the APFT, you know, on average, I believe it was maybe five or six percent would fail the uh, Army uh, physical fitness test. So as we developed these scales, um, we had developed them in a similar manner. So you would assume maybe four or five percent in each group may fail uh, the Army combat fitness test. We don't know. But here's our here are the min and max for those age groups and by norm by uh, men and women as you look at the scales and these are just the men and the max so um you know you, you could say why did we go back uh, the reason we went back is i think i already explained that is it's a general fitness test not an occupational fitness test and then when we look at it uh, the plank versus the leg tuck this was kind of re indicated in the RAND study for those that really want to dig in and read every line. I believe it's actually on page 14. Um, the page numbers have changed over time. At one point it says, you know, the leg tuck wasn't an accurate predictor of core strength for all soldiers. And that's that's why we looked into it and had a, you know, one exercise. We kept it the same so everybody would assess core strength. Um, but when you read below that, and there's a little chart again if you really wanted to dig into the data on the RAND study there's a chart that shows the leg tuck is is a good is a multiple component exercise so you have to have grip strength upper body strength and core strength so you couldn't exactly evaluate the core strength if you didn't have the grip strength and the upper body strength so we decided to go with one 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 event uh, and that would be the plank and a lot of units or correction, a lot of services or two already have a plank. So we use some of that information to develop our our plank scores. Um, but we had some data, but not a lot data. And so uh, we implemented these scoring based off of what the other services have done. Um, <laughs> OK. Uh, so that also the soldiers would have a similar testing experience. Now, um, on the temporary and permanent profiles, I'd ask you all again to read into um, the Army Directive and the XORG when you get into it, because there's, tempor there's temporary profiles, not to be confused with permanent profiles. Similar to the APFT is that if you're on a temporary profile, you should not be taking the ACFT. Uh, you just, when you recover, you recondition and take the, the, the PT test. Uh, that's pretty much the same as we have for the APFT. On permanent profiles, it's a little different. Um, I will clarify this a little bit. In the original version um, of either the Army Directive or the XORD, it said you must do max deadlift, sprint direct carry, and an aerobic event. We've taken out those other two because um, we try to implement probably too much in saying that, you know, we want to, um, and do max dead left and the sprint to carry and a rubber event. We've not done that prior to now. So with the APFT, uh, according to DOD policy and the Army policy, you must do an aerobic event. So we went, we took out the other two and just said, okay, if you're on a permanent profile, you have a similar result as it must do an aerobic event. And one of those aerobic events are the walk, stationary bike, swim, and the row. Again, this is just permanent profiles. If you have a permanent profile and you can do certain events uh, on the PT test, on the Army Combat Fitness Test, you will take those events. If you take the push-up, you'll get points for the push-up. If you don't take the sprint track carry, then you will get minimum points uh, if you needed those points for either promotion points or something later. Um, you would get a minimum score of 60, and that will not be averaged out or anything else. Is if you don't take that event and you are on a permanent profile, uh, you would receive 
a minimum passing score for that event. And for all the events that you take, you'll receive the score that you get. Um, these these policies uh, gives a long lead time for temporary profiles uh, for obvious reasons. Okay, now next slide. Here's the here are the 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 new ACFC standards and the timelines associated with that. So we're already in April, so you, you can um, move from the left to right. So you can administer an Army diagnostic a ACFT, and there will be no adverse actions. If you're in the active component, that will be a period of six months. And if you're in the Army Reserve, that will be to 1 April. You have until 1 April to administer a diagnostic. And then after 1 April 23, that will be your test of record. And you can start flagging on that time. And if you don't pass before 1 April of 24, you're allowed to be separated in that time. So we, we well, when we looked at the policies, uh, for separations and recovery because we do have a six event PT test and in the old policies there was a shorter time period we doubled the amount of time that you had to recover and pass the ACFT um, so we went to more time for you to recover and pass you still be flagged if you're an army reserve soldier if you haven't passed by April of 23 you're subject to be flagged and if uh, you don't pass that test by 1 April 24, you'll be allowed to be separated. And so I'll go down each one somewhat quickly. I just talked about the flags. Soldiers can extend uh, if they haven't passed the ACFT. Um, and you can do some kind of extension, but you will not be allowed to re-enlist uh, if, in fact, in 1 April 23, you have not passed the ACFT. Um, you will not be allowed to re-enlist. The valuations on 1 October. Uh, you'll be allowed to, I'm sorry, uh, with through dates of 1 April for active component, 1 April, uh, I'm sorry, 1 October 22, and then 1 April 23, you'll be allowed to put these on your NCOERs and evaluation reports in April 23. Uh, if you're commissioning, uh, it'll be required for all commissioning in April 23. Uh, I already talked about if, well, I did talk about it, but promotions, when you get promoted, if in 1 April 23 and you have not passed the Army Combat Fitness Test by 1 April, and you have to take it. And if you don't take it, you will be flagged. So starting 1 April, uh, if you're flagged, you're not allowed to stay in the Army until you actually pass the Army Combat Fitness Test. Um, we're still working on the, the promotion uh, points and how that will affect you uh, for those soldiers, for uh, specialist to sergeant and sergeant to staff sergeant. We may adjust those, um, but we have a we a uh, little bit of time to get the scales right, and we'll publish uh, exactly what the promotion point scales will be uh, shortly. Although I should have those out prior to um, one October of this year, and I just talked. To, I've already talked about separations, initial military training, um, starting in one October. All initial military training, if you're you know going to basic training in AIT, will be required to graduate and pass the Army and Combat Fitness Test. That's all components, everyone, in one October of 22. And the same thing for professional military education, all components, if you have a, if there is a graduation requirement or a prerequisite requirement for a physical fitness test in one October of 22, that will be a requirement. You must pass the Army and Combat Fitness Test in October of 22, regardless of the component, uh, if you start a professional military education that already has a requirement for a fitness standard. And we wanted to do that um, to not have different timelines for a school because we're in the all in the one army school system. OK. If you go to the last slide, please. Um, I think all leaders need to know this. Uh, you know, please, again, read the policy. And there, there'll be a chain teach that it's working its way all the way down. And the reason we ask everybody to do this is when we did Army Combat Fitness Test 3.0, the old version, uh, it felt like, you know, people didn't actually get this all the way down to what the test was. And it, and it caused some confusion because people were under the assumption that we we're using the old version. So the Army Combat Fitness Test has changed. It's just the Army Combat Fitness Test, and everyone needs to know the policies all the way down to the lowest level. 
and I look forward to your discussions. And I thank you for joining me today. So thanks. SMA, thank you. Our first question is coming from the 412th Theater Engineer Command. So if they would uh, unmute their microphone and we'll get them here on screen uh, and then uh, go ahead and ask your question when you're ready. Good afternoon, SMA. This is Specialist Mathis with the 412th Theater Engineer Command. My question for you today is, why is it that Compose 2 and 3 have an additional year to prepare for the ACFT versus Compose 1 when the only meaningful change has been the plane? Okay, thank you for the question. I just wanted to give you a little bit more time because um, you don't go, I don't know, you know, 30, 31 days a year, give you more time to allow you for a little bit of the change. And and some things didn't really change too much, but wanted to ensure that you had plenty of time to take the latest version and the diagnostic PT tests. So that there still is a requirement to for in the X order to do a diagnostic PT test before you do full implementation. And because of your schedules, we thought it would be prudent not to go that you only have six months. And when you look at the data, um, not every unit when asked to take the Army Combat Fitness Test has actually taken it um, in all compost. So we want to give you plenty of time for that diagnostic Army Combat Fitness Test before you got to the test of record. In order to do that with the amount of days that you work in a normal schedule uh, on duty, uh, we needed to give you more time. Thank you. All right, our next question comes from the 332nd Medical Brigade. So we will give them an opportunity to get their microphone off of mute and uh, ask their question. Three thirty second Medical Brigade, uh, nothing heard. OK, we'll go to the 85th uh, US Army Reserve Support Command uh, for our next question. Uh, I'll meet your microphone and we will take your question. It's hey, right there. We can uh, after this question, we can go back to them if they uh, get their mic fixed. Roger, certainly. OK, go ahead. Eighty fifth, anybody? OK, back to three thirty second and one thirty ninth medical will be after uh, after them if somebody. OK, I'll uh, go ahead and do a question from the Internet. Well, maybe we go back to the four twelve. <laughs> see, you know, their mic work. We just got to ask them to ask more questions. Um, so, uh, OK, four twelve, uh, we'll come back to you. Go ahead, start right here and see what happens. But. Uh, right. From Facebook, I mean, now that the new ACFT scoring uh, cards have been released, what does the data show when you compare the pass rates for the current test standards compared to the original version of the ACFT, and how does that compare to the APFT? Okay, that was, uh, I think, a complicated question. APFT versus ACFT versus... Um, well, we haven't done all the data yet compared to the new ACFT because we haven't taken it. <laughs> so it's going to be hard to compare something that you hadn't actually haven't taken and then compare it to the old APFT data. So we don't actually have the information ready and can compare the data. That's why we do uh, need that six months and to go ahead and get it into the system. We haven't even built the, uh, the digital training management system, haven't updated the scales in when you put it in. So we'll be able to compare it once we have all the data. However, when we took the old data and we said, uh, here's the pass rates, um, again, we just kind of based it off of what the old pass rates were and said, okay, if everybody that took the max deadlift, Here's everybody, uh, men and women, that's taken it, and here's all their ages. And uh, this is who scored uh, at the top. And we said, okay, if we scored at the top, 95% would fail. Okay, that's the, the top. And then at the minimum, uh, 5% uh, 
okay, what would be the minimum if only 5% failed that event, which is very similar to the APFT. So we expect the similar results, but we don't know yet because we actually haven't taken this version. So it's hard to compare something. We haven't gotten all the data. We need to get that, get that information in, but we expect similar results. I think that answers the question. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and do one more from uh, Facebook. We have a, a user, John May, who thinks these are just vetted questions uh, from units. So we'll go ahead and ask his uh, just to, to let him know. Uh, what are the odds, and uh, Sergeant Major Lombardo, feel free to, to come in on this one as well. The odds of Guard and Reserve soldiers getting a stipend uh, added to drill pay for gym membership or some other program to uh, help with training and access to equipment. Okay, I will be the first one to jump in. I will say <laughs> you can ask anything you want. We could start with that. Um, I've done more than one of these town halls, so uh, please ask whatever you want. So I'll throw that out. Um, that's number one. Number two, um, we still don't um, exactly see a need for a gym membership. And unfortunately, the, the example I gave everybody is all the gyms closed in the army, uh, I don't know, about March, 2020. <laughs> so um, everybody assumes that all the active component gyms were open. They actually weren't. So, but we still had a requirement to do the army combat fitness test. And believe it or not, I looked at every week, uh, probably about 18 months worth of data. And we actually saw the, the, the success rate go up uh, even during the, the pandemic. So, you know, a lot of gyms and all the gym lockers, they were closed too. Um, so somebody's like, well, you, but you had these other things. So uh, a lot of those things uh, with the active component were actually shut down, but we still had people taking the Army uh, combat fit fitness tests in certain locations, uh, even though they couldn't actually use the equipment, they'd pull it out and do just the test. And then that was it. Um, we've seen people get better. Um, I will tell you that the number one failed event, um, number one failed event is still the two mile run. Um, and the number one past event is the, the max deadlift. Um, so there's a lot of body weight things that you can do. Uh, there's a lot of um, exercises with minimum equipment, like, um, you know, just sprint up and down for the sprint drag carry, run backwards, run, do a lateral. Um, grab some sandbags. So there's a lot of things you can do. If you want, uh, get with the master fitness trainers or send a note to the master fitness school um, and they will send you an exercise plan. They did for me. I sent them and said, here's my weakest event. And the, the exercise they gave me actually were with uh, no equipment. Um, and I just say that right now we're not looking to give any gym memberships. Sir Major Lombardo, any follow up with that? SMA, thank you. I think the point that you made about the master fitness trainer, I know the schoolhouse is opening up significantly more seats available. Just So just to the leadership out there, just take a look at your units, ensure that you have adequate master fitness instructors in your units to be able to do exactly what the SMA is discussing. Um, there are some options that we're looking at uh, through the Reserve Organization of America through offering reduced um, gym memberships through Planet Fitness, and possibly uh, they're looking to donate some equipment uh, throughout uh, the Army reserve and army national guard but that's not going to affect uh, the citizen soldier that lives you know 60 miles away from a reserve center but they're looking at reduced memberships as far as funding through the army reserve as the sma said nothing is planned at this time start running over to you sma yeah i would say uh, um, to add on to the master fitness course is going to double the amount of slots they have for the master master fitness trainers and that's all compos are allowed to go to that course. Actually, I think about 50% of the instructors are Army National Guard and Army Reserve soldiers at the Master Fitness School. So they fully understand, um, you know, the complications of being a, a traditional guards soldier, National Guard or Army Reserve soldier. So we're doubling them out. The other thing we're also doing is we're trying to implement a tactical strength and conditioning facilitator course into the basic leader course so everyone will have a more in-depth knowledge of how to uh, exercise um, and do these movements appropriately uh, with body weight. All right, this may we'll go to uh, U.S. Army uh, Civil Affairs and Psychological Operations Command uh, for our next question. So 
uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Good afternoon, SMA. Yes, Sarah Williams. Master Sergeant Williams, I can hear you. It just uh, sounds really loud, but go ahead and ask your question and then, uh, then I'll, I'll try to answer it. My apologies, that's me. Um, given the personnel and time constraints of the U.S. Army Reserve on VA weekends, can units use GS civilians to help administer and grade the, S the ACFT? Um, I'll, I'll ask Sergeant Major Lombardo if he wants to jump in, but I, I don't think so. I think, um, you know, if it's a flagging action uh, that has to be done by soldiers with an NCOIC and uh, and uh, an OIC, and they could probably help set up the equipment. They could probably, you know, kind of help you out with maybe some administrative things, but I'm still I, I'm almost certain that has to be done by an Army soldier. Uh, and and we're not going to leave that up to civilians, just especially on the grading. And Sir Major Lombardo, anything I missed on that? Hey, thanks, thanks, SMA. Uh, so thanks for the question. You're you're spot on, SMA. That's going to be a an Army Reserve soldier or a, or an Army soldier that's uh, that's going to administer it. Thanks. All right, our next question comes from social media. Uh, you said the uh, the two mile event uh, was the most failed event. So why? Uh, would we not look at lowering that or uh, making it another change to that as opposed to increasing the time? Um, I believe you're asking uh, why I do a two mile run as opposed to adjusting the run times um, because we're looking at the, we're trying to get the VO2 max and it's not about running, it's about your VO2 max and how do we get that? And I, I'm almost certain you have to run about 12 minutes to get that VOT max and that threshold so we can appropriately assess that. So we do need a length of time for you to run to do that. That also lends into why it has to be done in a certain order. So you can't do the run and do, do the sprint drag carry and do certain things because it's designed in that, in that specific order to get the appropriate effects on the body. So um, we're not doing it just to address you for two miles. It's to make sure we get appropriate assessment of your VO2 max. Okay, thank you for that. And we'll go back to uh, 139th uh, Medical Brigade if, if uh, they're up now. Hello, SMA. This is Specialist Hall. How will score for the promotion points be calculated? Okay, uh, we're still we're working on the exact score. Uh, we had about four courses of action that we were working on uh, to reduce those. I believe we're going to reduce some of the promotion point score a little bit. And I think I got the percentages not at the top of my head, but about 24, 25 percent of your grade on the current ACFT promotion points were only physical fitness. So. And that was much larger than any other component. In other words, if you ex shoot expert with your rifle or you had uh, similar things that you'd done, um, your PT test was overly weighted to any other component uh, of the promotion points. So we're looking to do, reduce that so it may not be the overall arching component. And then put emphasis on those things uh, for soldier skills like expert soldier badge, weapons marksmanship. So I don't know the exact promotion points yet. We're still just trying to get a little bit of the data on them, the ACFT, but we'll make that adjustment uh, soon. Because right now, uh, if you're at E4 going to E5, it's 180 promotion points. We're looking to reduce that a little bit, but just so it's proportional to the other events and try to incentivize those other combat skills like the expert soldier badge. So we're looking to double that, the amount of points you would get, but we don't have it exact right, but we're looking to reduce it somewhat. So it's a little bit less of a, you know, the main proponent of your promotion points. Thank you. 
Yes, Mayor, next question comes from social media uh, about flagging. Regarding soldiers flagged for APFT, are soldiers flagged for AFT no longer flagged or are they still flagged and do they have to take an APFT to remove that or can they take an ACFT uh, to remove that flag? Well, I, I would say if you're still flagged for the APFT and you're still in the Army, I would you know, question someone's leadership. So um, the APFT has not been allowed for a long time. I think uh, even in basic training, took that out in 2019, so three years. And then in 2020, we said that, uh, you know, the ACFT is the test record. And then we said, well, if you in the latest XORD, not the one we just published or <laughs> the one prior to this, and I think that was around January or June of 2020, it said, if you have failed the APFT, you will be flagged and you will remain flagged until you pass the ACFT. I'm sorry, the APFT. So if you were flagged for the APFT and you're still flagged, that's been like two years. So uh, yes, you have to pass the APFT because right now, um, the a if you would like to do anything, that is still a valid order. Um, and then in the regulation or the Army Directive, we did have a small clause about you could take the APFT if you don't have one for promotion points because the promotion points will come later. So if for some reason you'd only taken the ACFT and uh, you needed promotion points, you would have to take an APFT. So until 1 April of 23, you may actually have to take one uh, if you would like to increase your promotion points. If you're not, then um, you, once the promotion points are in effect for ACFT, you will take the AP, ACFT. However, if you've been flagged that long, uh, I would question what's going on and why you haven't passed the APFT already. Sergeant Major Lombardo, anything that I missed on that? No, no, SMA, and I think you, you received somewhat of a similar question last Wednesday. Acknowledge all. All right. All right. Uh, so we made our next question uh, will come from the. Stu, uh, back to use of uh, headquarters if they want to unmute themselves and uh, come back on for their next question. All right. Good afternoon, SMA. My name is Sergeant Gustafson. Here at USA KPOC, we're stationed on Fort Bragg, so we're very fortunate to have numerous resources when it comes to conducting the ACFT. However, other units may not have the same level of resources. Currently, there's a time hack from start to end of the ACFT, but for the units that have a test site location and a run route in different areas, they may not be able to hit that time hack. Is uh, there any way or possibility to change the verbiage to read to the ACFT should be attempted to be given within a certain time frame? Um, no. So uh, we need to. Okay, you're going to have to come back and say that why we can't execute this because when if I have more time, I mean. There's a reason the runtime is a little slower is because you just did a sprint drag carry. Then you just did, you know, the next event and then you did a plank and then you get ready to go. If I get, you know, I don't know, an hour between my plank and my runtime, I'll probably score fairly well. And so those standards are there to make sure everybody has a very similar test experience. So um, if I have an, a distinct advantage by a much longer and I'm not talking about a few minutes because I'm the first one to do the plank or the end. But if I get an hour and a half um, between my plank and my runtime, uh, my runtime will probably be a lot faster. And I don't think that's uh, the similar standards that we've set forth. So we just need to, to kind of figure that out. Um, I'm sure you can. Um, you, you can work through that. Uh, we've had this issue for many years in all kinds of components and all kinds of locations. Uh, you know, based off run routes and weather, and there's all kinds of things that come into play um, because we've all had this, but uh, it needs to be a very similar step, not a 
it's not about um, you know location. It's about making sure that there's one standard. So if you have a, a much longer time between those events, it would give uh, someone a distinct advantage. If, if I may, SMA, just to to address that a little further. So in the Army Reserve, the way we distributed uh, the Army combat uh, fitness test equipment was by facility. So we have about uh, slightly over 700 fil uh, facilities across the 50 states, five U.S. territories. And every facility or facility group has uh, uh, sets of ACFT. Nothing dictates through, you know, this, this may be a training management issue. Uh, nothing says that you have to take the ACFT at a facility, and nothing says that you can't go to another location to take the ACFT. Uh, I'll give you an example. London, Derry, New Hampshire, uh, there's an Armed Forces Reserve Center there that's got Army National Guard and Army Reserve soldiers there. And and uh, the, the the terrain is suited so where you can't uh, do the run. So what they do is they contract with the localized readiness division um, to get an indoor location where they can actually do the run and do the Army Combat Fitness Test events. So your leadership works through the readiness divisions in the United States Army Reserve headquarters to ensure that there is an adequate location where you can take it if your specific facility um, is not suited to do that. And just keep in mind, you know, the regular army also has, you know, recruiting stations in different places around the country, like let's say Chambers Street in Manhattan, and they also have to use some, you know, ingenuity in order to be able to take the army combat fitness test over to USMA. Yes, sir, Major, thank you. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of challenges, no matter the compo. Yeah, when I look at Wainwright, Alaska, um you know we got to make some adjustments there too and we're all working through that and and even taking uh, an army combat fitness test in one of the the um air force uh, provided facilities we gotta i think at some point we do actually have to think of much broader on this group than we have been we have rotc programs with active duty soldiers at a lot of universities that have you know great facilities ready to do this and they have equipment too so I think we just have to broaden our uh, the way we think of it through training management. But there's a lot more equipment and facilities out there in your state than uh, you would realize. Again, I just ask you to think think of if there's an active duty soldier at a you know, the University of Auburn. Um, why can't I use that facilities to take that those facilities to take my Army Combat Fitness Test? Thank you. Esme, you, you actually just uh, answered the next question about just what are some uh, different ways that uh, soldiers that are are not co-located uh, from their reserve center uh, could find ways to train. So I don't know if there's anything more you would want to just uh, illustrate on that point uh, or we'll go to the next unit question. Yeah, I, I just think um, there's a lot more than, than we think that are available. Recruiting stations actually have you know, they have some of the equipment, meaning every soldier has to do the OPAT, so which we've already issued out um, a deadlift bar and weight and and a ball. So they have some of that stuff, too. And uh, those are locations all across the, the country in a lot of states. So um, just to broaden it up, I didn't even talk about just the recruiters that have some of that equipment, too. All right, thank you. Our next question uh, from social media is about uh, a lot of the DA forms and the ATPs and the FNs. Uh, just any indication on when we can start to see some of those uh, forms and, and manuals be updated with uh, to reflect these changes? Yes, um, the, the biggest one for me is the digital training management system, which is our system of record to get that inputted so that you don't have to do a manual you know, here, uh, calculation of the score. So uh, CAC-T, which is the Combined Arms Center Training, um, has that responsibility. They're looking to have that piloted out in May and for a release in June. So in the digital training management system, about the first week of June is where we anticipate that you could put the test in DTMS and then we'll give you the appropriate score based off the standard. So we got to write the code. And then because we told them, you know, like three weeks ago, go figure out the code because uh, we didn't tell anybody till um, the last week in March. So they're, they're trying to figure out the code. So again, around the mid June, I think we'll start seeing 
some of the digital training management system. We're working on that first, and then the ATPs will will come as quickly as we can. The good news is that we really don't need to change a lot of our manuals. They've been, you know, we changed them 10 years ago. We just need to pull them out and read through them and uh, read them. They've got some really good training plans and in, uh, in the training manuals. All right, thank you. I uh, will go to uh, Master Sergeant Sibley, Sibley, sorry for the pronunciation there uh, for our next question. That's all right. Afternoon, SMA, CSM Lombardo. It's uh, Master Sergeant Sibley with the MI Readiness Command out of Fort Belvoir. Um, just during our our diagnostic test, I noticed that we had some soldiers who may not have been given their all um, because there was no consequence during that phase. Just wondering if there's any built-in mechanism so that we could possibly adjust the scoring standards once we get more data from soldiers actually going all out for the test SMA. Over. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we, we had a big debate over this uh, probably for about a year now about this, you know, are people really giving it 100%? And um, there was some key indicators that they weren't. So if your runtime all of a sudden was 37 minutes uh, or 38 minutes on a two mile run, uh, I'd say that you weren't giving it 100% or giving it anything. So that's an extremely amount, long amount of time. Um, so yes, the scores uh, will be adjusted, and we're looking at ways to incentivize uh, giving it your all and then adjusting these scores over time. However, the governance, like I talked about, every, uh, well, I, twice a year, they'll look at it and look at uh, all the data. And and then when we look at the data, we, we actually do see uh, the scores increasing over time uh, based off of uh, how do we perform? There's a couple of things that we, you know, you may not see increase on, though. I want to be very cautious. We do, you know, again, this is a little technical, but when you look at some of the data, meaning uh, we'll take one event, the max deadlift, there are gains to a point, meaning if I start getting really heavy on the the deadlift, that doesn't actually give you a good overall performance. So if I can do, you know, 600 on a deadlift, that doesn't make it uh, the physical fitness, the performance that we're looking at. So the, there's some things that may be capped that maybe you could do a lot more on, but uh, we're not trying to get increase that that capability is just to do a deadlift. So, but there is the mechanism with the structure to relook the scores for, and that we are looking to increase those minimum scores over time. Thanks, SMA. Thank you. We'll go to the 139th Medical Brigade for our next question. Good afternoon, SMA. This is First Lieutenant Fields with the 139th Medical Brigade. Uh, considering the training that is needed to be done for the ACFT, which can cause soldiers to put on an increase in muscle mass, when can we expect an update to the current height and weight standards? Well, I will be clear, you might not see any change to the height and weight standards. <laughs> so there's a study that's ongoing right now to to kind of determine if we need that. And uh, I would really like to say, uh, as we look across, are you really putting on more lean muscle mass? Um, and we are, the study shows that maybe you're not. Maybe we're just getting bigger. So our goal is to to look at this and say, are we actually putting on lean muscle mass? We've run that study on Fort Bragg, and I encourage you all, if it comes to your state or camp post station, please take a part in that uh, survey. It's a volunteer body composition survey, and we need you know multiple compos. We need every, you know older folks, younger folks. We need all body shapes and and types. Uh, and then when we when we did this at Fort Bragg, we actually saw some people go, no, I don't want to do it. Uh, that's that's actually hasn't um, been helpful for the survey. So what we had to do is actually had to go back in and um, extend the amount of time we needed for the survey. And for those that don't know what we're doing on the body composition, you know, survey is you come in and you you do four different types of testing. You'll do what's called a DEXA. It's a dual X-ray uh, scanner, and they'll scan, and that's the most accurate. A piece of equipment we can find in the nation that gives you lean muscle mass and bone density. 
Then you'll do like an electrode scan where it sends little electrodes in your body. And then there's one scan of the body and just tells you how you do. And then and then the end is the tape. Uh, so um, and and we're calculating your Army Combat Fitness Test scores. So of course we're going to have to readjust some of the scores because didn't have the exact test. So um, we're looking to see what's the discrepancy. Is there a discrepancy from the tape test to all those other ones? Will it be cost efficient to, you know, build, you know, buy a, you know, a forty or fifty thousand dollar machine? Where would that be located? And it's really complex when you talk about United States Army Reserve soldiers. Uh, so if you were to fill the tape, where would you go get this other scan done? Um, and how accurate is the tape so we're we're getting all that done i'm hopeful to get all that completed in the next few months um, and then there'll be an out brief and then there'll be decisions um, based off of the science not on speculation or you know my thoughts on it so there's a lot of scientists and data scientists that are looking at that it should be complete by this summer but it may not be any changes um so I just I wouldn't just lean in that we're doing a height and weight study and then I'll not automatically say, well, yep, we're going to make some changes because when I when I did my um, and I went down and I was I am actually my data is part of the survey. Um, it was to my benefit to do the tape test. I was probably about three to four to maybe six or seven percent less body fat in the tape test that I was in all the scans that I was done. Meaning if I were to be scanned, I had more body fat uh, than what the tape test told me. Um, so we're looking at three things. Number one is um, how did you do on your fitness test? How do you do on and compared to your height and weight uh, scales? Um, you know, how did that tape test compare to the other mechanisms that we did? Um, and we're also looking at the height and weight tables. Are they accurate? So it's it's multiple components of the aspect, and that's why it, uh, the survey. I'm sorry that why we need more time to get through and then get it finished. And that's why we need all kind of body types and shapes and sizes. You need to be able to give us your ACFT data so we can put that in the system, scan your body. Don't try to cheat the system. And then then we all need some time to analyze that. And we're trying to get that all done by October, but I. Until I see the data on what we need to, to execute, all I know is my data. Um, so we'll need some more time to get that done. Um, we're hoping to see, yes, everybody put on, you know, 5% lean muscle mass. But that's not been what we've seen uh, in the when I was there. So I'll have to get the data and look at it. Thank you. All right. Uh Quickly, we'll just uh, any other units that are online um, that that had a question or something came up. Well, we'll just do one very short alibi. Uh, raise your hand in the chat. Um, otherwise, the SMA. Uh, OK, great. Uh, 412th Engineer Command will uh, take last question uh, from you. Uh, SMA, um, want to know where can we send inquiries um, or comments that we have uh, questions uh, about this um, town hall after over well if you hated the town hall um send it to sergeant rainier uh i don't know i mean i guess if you know you want to do an aar you know well, you know if you thought it was that bad i mean um uh, and then the second one was sent it to um, Sergeant Major Lombardo. He loved, you know, you want, I'll give you his personal email, or you can send it to me. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, Sergeant uh, Rainier, are we keeping the chat open for a period? Normally we keep the chat open for a little while, so you can send in comments in there, and then Sergeant Rainier monitors that for a period of time, but I'm not sure. We will, SMA, and we have uh, leaders present in the Facebook Live comments as well. Okay, does that answer your question or do you have a, you want to give me an AAR comment like right now in front of everybody as we close this out? Be bold, stand up. <laughs> well, no, uh, that answered my question, SMA. Thank you. 
All right, Sergeant Major Lombardo, we'll uh, go ahead. Now, hold on. We'll, we'll do last question. Somebody else has their uh, hand up, but this will be the last one, I think. Uh, looks like. Sergeant Toki. 807. Med. Sergeant Toki. That's me. Sergeant Toki from uh, 807 Med Brigade. SMA, this is uh, Captain Represses from the Second Medical Brigade in Kent Parks, California. Uh, as Sergeant Major Lombardi said, the purpose of all of these changes in the ACFT is to increase unit and personal readiness. Has there been any studies or results, even at a small scale, that show and prove that units that participate in these tests actually have increased unit and personal readiness? Over. Um, Yes. yes, you you, you really have really to combine have multiple to. things, and 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 I'll I'll kind of you know combine how we the the small study of when you add in um, the holistic health and fitness capabilities, we've seen a reduction in muscular skeletal injuries, um, and I re the reason I have to say in the holistic health and fitness form and not for the ACFT is because the National Defense Authorization Act said, I can't, I can't pull your data as an individual. It, it's literally impossible to, for me to know if you increased your score on the ACFT, were you in better shape? Did you have less physical uh, ailments? Because I was not allowed to pull your individual data. So meaning if I can't pull your individual data and go compare that to how you're doing on profile more or less, it's hard to do a study on something that they said, you know, the National Defense Authorization, they said, you're not allowed to do Army. So I go back to the holistic health and fitness. So before that NDAA language is in there, when we implemented holistic health and fitness and we had those tactical strength and conditioning facilitators and we had the occupational therapists and we were doing different training for this test, we saw less muscular skeletal injuries so it's kind of going all the way back a couple of years because it was hard to compare data when um, we weren't allowed to pull the data out of a system and compare it to an individual um, we could just we just got scores and demographics is that so when we did the study you could say well you had the score but when i pulled it it just said you know male 54 um and then here's the score so, but it didn't say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, Sergeant Major Grinston. So it just had, you you know, your age, your demographics, and then a score. And then that's how we got all the data, but we weren't allowed to compare it. But we do believe the, the ultimate goal was to change how we do physical fitness and have less injuries, uh, less lower back injuries, less uh, musculoskeletal injuries. And that's what the, that is the ultimate goal of what we're trying to do. But thank you for the question. Thank you, SMA. All right, SMA, we'll uh, go now to just some closing comments. Uh, we do want to be respectful of, uh, of the time. Uh, a lot of these units are having their battle assembly currently. Uh, so Sergeant Major Lombardo uh, or SMA Grinston, uh, any final thoughts? So I, I guess I'll, I'll start it out. So so SMA, just I guess number one is, is thank you for taking the time out of the day to to uh, do a second town hall and uh, and answer some of the questions for our Army Reserve soldiers. Just for, for our leadership out there, just remember, so April of 2024 is a requirement to take a a, a record um, Army combat fitness test, but but don't wait to April 2024, right? Like challenger soldiers out there um, and, and any time from from here forward, you know, get get them out there, exercise the equipment, get them familiar with the, them. They should be familiar, um, you know, with the supporting exercises to take the ACFT. Um, and just for the soldiers out there, you, you're not going to get fit by conducting PRT during battle assembly weekends. You have to make this part of a, you know, part of part of your uh, holistic health and, and and life and and establish a fitness program throughout the month. Um, and your master fitness truck, uh, master fitness trainers can help you with that. But finally, I think I think I'm not sure if this was pointed out, but the uh, the uh, 2.5 mile walk has been added. And SMA, I believe you did cover it. But uh, 
and, and that's just uh, in, in the event that there's some locations where uh, where it's not uh, you know where, where you may need to exercise that um, with that SMA um, appreciate all and uh, looking forward to get this going over to you yeah just in closing I want to say again thank you thank you for all that you've done in the last two uh, years and really in regards to you know COVID you know forest fires hurricanes um, we the nation could not have survived the, the last two years in my opinion without your hard work and your dedication uh, to your country and you continue to work hard um, you get uh, no notice asked all the time to go do whatever it is. And every time you've been asked, you just kind of execute it, whether it's putting together, you know, 14, you know, urban augmentation medical task forces, which was a couple of years ago. And it's just like, hey, we're just going to go do this. And uh, soldiers here just kind of did these kind of things. So, again, uh, thank you. And thank you for uh, taking the time uh, to listen. And thank you for all your hard work and dedication as a citizen soldier. You have to manage uh, your job, uh, the United States Army Reserve, your family. And, and oh, by the way, we want you to stay fit and do all these other things. So I really appreciate all that you do, uh, not only just uh, for your communities, but for the country. So thank you and have a wonderful day. All right, that does conclude our program today. I want to thank everyone for joining us here on Teams and online. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and leave them in the chat or right there in the comments on Facebook Live. Uh, and that concludes today's program. Thank you.